it's a little bit. All right, my recording is in progress. So here we go. Everything else that's happened is forgotten. So hey, welcome for coming to our uh, introduction to bow hunting tonight. And we are going to be joined by John Waddles Jr. He's our one of our illustrious, I'll call him illustrious, bow hunter education instructors and his partner in crime, Mr. Robert Moore. He's been with us for many years too. Uh, Johnny, give us a quick bio of who uh, you are, where you're from, and why you're a bow hunter. Uh, originally, I was uh, I was born in Omaha, Nebraska, but I was raised in Wichita, Kansas. I uh, the military brought me out to California, and I've been here ever since. I've uh, been in, involved in archery for 53 years, uh, and then uh, I got involved in uh, hunter education as far as bow hunter ed, and I've been doing that for 43 years. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate your service, both to our military and to us. Uh, Robert? Uh, yes, I've been uh, bow hunting since about the mid-80s. Um, I'm also a uh, level three uh, archery instructor, and then I work under Mr. Waddles as the, uh, near the bow hunter education program. All right. Well, I thank you guys both for your help tonight. Um, so here they are with some of their game taken. There's a Idaho bull for Robert and uh, what is that? Washington whitetail. Is that what you said it was, Johnny? Uh, yeah, we don't see that picture, but yeah, it is a Washington whitetail. Okay, perfect. Uh, oh, I'm not sharing my screen. Yeah, we're not seeing right. that picture. There we go. You guys keep me on track. I really appreciate that. All right, so you should see it now, right? Yes. All right, thanks. Not so yet. there's our there's our expert panel. Uh, they they joined me earlier uh, for a webinar on turkey hunting uh, with archery equipment, and uh, had to have them back. So thanks. So some of our talking points for tonight, um, we are going to talk about why bow hunting, why people should get into started, or why you know why you've been bow hunting, why people should look at bow hunting as a possibility for getting out in the field. Uh, what it takes to get started, you know, acquiring equipment, maybe judging quality versus affordability, uh, where to get help, and the progressions of an archer. So those are the things we're going to try and get started. So um, why bow hunt, gentlemen? Robert, uh, Johnny, let's, wh why did you get into bow hunting? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, I got into bow hunting uh, because at the time I couldn't afford to buy a rifle. I, I bought my first uh, bow set up. It, it, was, it was everything. Uh, it was twenty five dollars from a from a white front store. If you know what a white front store is, mm -hmm. but I got it's like a it's like a Target or or Walmart. It's like a Walmart. Uh, it's up in Washington State. Anyway, I uh, uh, I got started. I I went hunting. I think I hunted all of all of two days. I had one shot at a at a at a doe, which was legal take at that time, and. Uh, I was so thrilled with it. I mean, I think the arrow must have been uh, 50 yards above it. I, I was nowhere close, but I was so thrilled with the with the with the fact that I was able to to, to get a shot. I uh, that's when I I came back and, and I got involved in it seriously. I started taking uh, lessons and started. To, uh, I got fitted for proper equipment and been doing it ever since. Perfect. Thanks. How about you, Robert? Oh, I got mainly into the challenge and I had some friends that were already bow hunting and uh, over the years it's become more and more uh, fun to do and it also has opened up some extra available hunts that is, is strictly for archery only or bow hunting only so I had some additional opportunities. Now are either one of you uh, rifle uh, hunters for big game or shotgunners for small game or anything like that? Uh, very little. Yeah, I have uh, I have shot one deer with a rifle here in California, uh, but I have a shotgun, uh, you know, for pheasants, uh, upland game, uh, and and ducks. Okay, so archery is your primary choice of uh, going into the field. Yes. Great, great. All right. So when we talk about getting started, where does a person get started in in the archery tradition? What What's the first step? Johnny? Uh, I would say that to get started, uh, uh, a person needs to go to an archery pro shop. 
when he goes to that archery pro shop, he'll he'll get fitted for for there's three things you have to uh, you have to know about when he's going to buy archery equipment. You want to know uh, which which you, your eye is is dominant. Uh, you want to know uh, what kind of bow you want, whether it be a recurve or a compound. Uh, you want to know that you're in your draw length and and the weight you want to pull, and and all those can be discovered at a at an archery pro shop. Uh, what what else, Robert? What what else uh, what could you add to that? Um, and when, once you decide on the equipment and get properly set up, um, it makes it a lot easier to start learning the process of shooting. And that would be the next step: is learning how to shoot consistently and effectively. Yeah. So what we would like to help people out, you know, in this um, realm is like figuring out how do I get started and I want to go out and buy equipment. Is, is there like a price point that we're looking at? I mean, how, how much can a person expect to pay and what's the best way for them to obtain? I mean, are they going to buy piecemeal, maybe buy a bow one time or maybe try to buy a combo kit? Uh, what are some of the things that some of these um, people wanting to get into archery should be asking their pro shop when they go in? Most of the most of the pro shop are are, are, are catalog orders places like uh, Bass Pro and uh, and the Sports and Warehouse. They have what they call a ready to hunt. It's an R R T H uh, yeah. setup, and it, it comes with bows, arrows, uh, 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 sights, uh, the, the, everything you would need to to as far as equipment uh, to assist with the, with the bow to to hunt as far as uh, uh, the weapon is concerned. And uh, and they're usually at a at a from low to a medium price range. And low would be what? And uh, low would be like two hundred dollars. Uh, medium, the the maybe the five and six. Now that that's that's for a compound bow. Yes, that's that's for a compound bow. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, some people might uh, might have only experience having shot a recurve bow, which um, on the shared screen, you'll see that down there in the bottom uh, left, which is just the string and the two arrows there. That's a recurve. Uh, some people will enter into the, the, the tradition with that setup, or they might enter with a compound bow. Um, the compound bow, uh, probably more popular, right? Uh, I mean, most people that we, as in the field, see uh, hunting, we'll see them with a compound bow. But the traditionalists are people who maybe are, um, you know, maybe they have um, a price point that was too low for the compound, might join us out in the field with that recurve. Uh, they're both effective, right, gentlemen? Uh, uh, yes, I, I hunted with the uh, recurve uh, many years before the compound was invented. so. Uh, the, the, the recurve is, is, is definitely uh, effective along with the longbow. Is, is there a drawback to either one? Like, I, I know all the, the gadgets you can put on a compound bow make it a really effective um, piece of work. Um, but as far as if you practice, that, that uh, recurve will allow you to shoot um, fairly regularly out to distances to 40, 50, 50 yards, right? Would that be possible? Uh, what, yes, uh, for, for hunting, uh, that, that's, that's very possible. I mean, uh, in the Olympics, it's not, it's not a hunting scenario, but their recurve shoot out to uh, 90 meters. Yes. So uh, the biggest uh, uh, difference between the two bows, other than one being mechanical and one being a traditional, is that with a, with a, with a recurve bow, Say you get a, a recurve bow that's uh, 45 pounds. When you get it back to your anchor and you get your draw length, you're actually holding 45 pounds. Where if you get a, a 45 pound compound, when you get it back to your anchor and the and the cams come over, you're holding anywhere from 50 to 80 percent less weight than 45 pounds. So you're holding a lot a, a lot less weight. And you're able to hold that longer uh, in case the animal is moving or whatever, you could follow it and still not be holding the 45 pounds. Yet. Yeah. So what he's saying essentially is that these compound bows, if it was a 45 pound bow 
at full draw, you're only holding nine pounds worth of weight, pressure, whatever. And that allows you to be more accurate with your shot because you're not holding a full 45 pounds on your full draw. So definitely an advantage of buying a compound bow and looking at compound bows. Um, we talked a little bit yesterday in preparation for this webinar. And I know you guys both told me, I think the bow was, you know, as far as equipment wise was very important, but also you mentioned the arrows were, were very important. What, what was the reasoning for that, Robert? So um, the arrows are gonna be matched to the bow related to draw length, draw weight and arrow point. So it's called spine because every time the bow is released, the arrow is gonna bend. So if it's a weak spine, it may bend too much and that could create a safety problem. And if it's too stiff, it may not be as accurate or hard to tune, which we'll discuss later. So arrows are very important. It's, it's the, they work in tandem together. So you definitely want those matched. And when it was mentioned going to the, to the pro shops, once you decide on the bow, whether it's compound or recurve and the draw weight and stuff, there's a chart that, we can, that goes through and comes up with a, 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 a range of spines that will work with your bow. You'll just have to decide on what maybe material you use, whether it's aluminum or carbon. Gotcha. So you're mentioning the different types of materials that are available for arrows. There's carbon, aluminum, wood, uh, fiberglass. They all have their different uses possibly. And just looking in the shared screen, you can see there's different veins on those arrows and that's kind of what helps it spin or stay in, in line in, in line of flight. And there's different varieties of, of veins uh, and materials, right? There's, um, I think on that picture, it's showing maybe a four inch vein all the way down to a quick spin, which is maybe an inch or two, or what, what do you guys uh, have any preference on those or tell people what to look out for on when it comes to setting up arrows? Um, there, the two type of materials are basically plastic and then a, a turkey feather. Um, the turkey feather is of course a lot more forgiving, um, but they're not as durable either. And so, and depending on if you coat them or not, the weather could play a, a part on it too, mainly for, um, rain, but, uh, for durability, the, the plastic veins are going to be better. And as far as length concerned, um, the veins design is to, to help steer the arrow or make it uh, straighten up. And um, the longer the fletch or more surface area, the faster it'll do that. Height is also a part of that formula. So you could have a short vein, but a higher height, but the surface area is the same as maybe uh, one that's a little bit longer, but not so high. Mm -hmm. um, so you may get, if you have clearance issues on the bow, especially on the compound, then the height of the air, uh, vein will make a difference too, whether you clear the string or, or the riser and stuff. Okay, so I'm, I'm just trying to play this in a, in a um, chronological order for somebody maybe going into a store. So maybe they're gonna look at a bow, they're gonna maybe go in with a budget of, you know, whatever that budget is, but um, there are pro shops that have all these bows, maybe ready to hunt or they have some components on it, or maybe they're naked bows, just not without any components and they build onto them, but, uh, I think it's probably best, you know, the boat, the pro shop is going to measure you for draw length. They have a way of doing that, right? And that's um, considering the, the safety aspect of that and how much you can pull back. Uh, don't try to be Superman and try to say, oh, yeah, I can pull back 70 pounds or, you know, if you need something lighter, uh, the biggest thing is to be comfortable with what you're shooting. So don't try to be um, muscle man, he man you know, Incredible Hulk, Wonder Woman, whatever it is, uh, make sure that you can comfortably pull that, that bow and it feels comfortable. These two gentlemen will tell you being comfortable shooting the bow is more most important. Um, isn't that right? I think, Johnny, you mentioned it doesn't really matter which brand you choose just as long as you feel comfortable shooting it. Is that true? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, I know when the when the, the, the person wants to go and get into involved in archery and he goes to the pro shop, uh, he has a budget. I, I know how important a budget is. But I, I usually suggest uh, people when they ask me, when you go into that pro shop, uh, they'll, they'll let you shoot just anything that your eye wants to look at you think is great. So 
shoot all the bows, not just the, 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 the ones in your price range, but shoot, shoot the ones that are above your price range so you could tell the difference of how, they're, how they feel. If you, if you don't know, you know, you, you, the ones you want is in your price range, you, you pull that back, boom. Then you, you buy, see the one that's a little higher, you pull it back. Now you know why the price is different, because it feels different, it feels better. You're, you're, it's not less strain pulling the bow back in the whole bit. So uh, I would suggest you go, go shoot them all and then, then buy the ones you can afford. But definitely go to the shop because you got to get measured for your draw length. And you want to uh, know how much, you know, in my opinion, when I uh, teach uh, men and women, girls or boys or whatever, my, my female students usually learn a lot quicker because when they pick out a bow, if they can't pull that bow back in the shop without hurting or straining, uh, they'll say, turn it, turn it down. You know, I, I need to take it down. Consequently, in doing so, it's a lot easier for them. They enjoy the, 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 the sport and they learn to shoot more correctly because they're not fighting the physical weight or the draw weight of the bow. Good, good, good knowledge there. Uh, somebody had a question in the chat regarding brace height. Uh, they wanted to know what brace height was. Maybe we, we uh, I don't know if we mentioned it maybe just right now, but we don't want to get too technical on this, but if you want to go ahead, Robert, and tell them what brace or brace height is in relation to a bow. Yeah, so brace height basically is where you put your hand in the bow, that's called a pivot. It's a measurement between there and the string. So the longer the brace height is or further away from the bow, the arrow is um, pushed the least amount of time. The brace height that's closer to the bow or shorter, the bow can, the string will push on the, on the arrow longer and have a little bit more power. The flip side of that though is, is depending on how your arm is placed in the bow, the shorter brace height may start hitting your arm um, just where it starts to come in the angle. So that's something to, to keep in mind. And, and as John said, when you go to the pro shop and you shoot them and you have different brace, brace heights on the different bows, you may find out that a particular brace height feels better um, and, and or if it's too short, it may, like I said, hit your arm. So you just, some of the variables have to think about. Other than that, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a concern, but if you're just starting out, if you, got, if you have a bow that's comfortable to shoot, you're, gonna, you're just gonna be more accurate and that's more important. Good, good when answer to that. When you talk about brace height, usually the, the longer the brace height, the bow is a lot easier to, to shoot. To pull. Uh, and the shorter the brace height, uh, the, the bow is a lot faster. The arrow is shot a lot faster. So it, you want smoothness versus speed when it comes to your brace height. And when you can find the combination that works best for you, then that's the bow to get, right? Definitely. Yes. A couple of other uh, components that would be on a bow that the pro shop will be able to help you out with that maybe, you know, if you bought a bow secondhand, it, it would be completely off. But that's like the peep sight and the actual sight itself on the front. And we know there's different types of sights um, available with, uh, I've seen, single post sites and I've seen multi-pin sites. Um, you guys have anything to say on uh, sites that people should look at for their bows? Um, if you're looking at, um, uh, one thing to consider is just durability. When you're out hunting, it, it may get bumped and or uh, hit on something. If the site is, is, has a lot of plastic in it, then it's not gonna be very durable. So um, find one that is, is all metal for the most part. That way, when you make adjustments to it, the uh, set screws don't dig into it and make it hard to readjust again. Um, and as far as uh, um, there's a, a, the five pin or the single pin uh, that's movable, there's movable sites and there's fixed pin sites. Um, the, you can really make that uh, technical in the sense that the easiest is the five pin site where each pin is set a particular yardage. And if there's something in between, say uh, it's 35 or 36, you know it's between the 20 and, or the 30 and the 40 pin, you'll have to figure out the gap. On the movable site, you have to take time that if you range it, you have to move the site, mm -hmm. um, depending on which it is. And that could take time. And if the animal moves, then you gotta rearrange again and then remove the site again, possibly. Yeah. So there's a lot more effort in, in the actual hunting 
uh, depending on what site you put in. Yeah. Uh, some, yes, uh, most people that uh, that do spotting stock type hunting would, would use a multi pin like a five pin or a three pin site. Most guys that hunt from a tree stand versus uh, or a ground blind might use a single pin site. Okay. Myself, I have, uh, I think it's a spot hog seven deadly pins uh, site. And it's really nice. It has uh, the fiber optics on it that gathers light and makes those pins really easy to see, even in low light conditions. So I, I really like that one. Um, somebody had a question about axle um, length and whether, whether you would have a shorter one or a longer one when you're having a beginner shooter, is there any difference when it comes to axle length? The, the, if I, if I was, uh, if you're going to shoot with fingers, you need a longer axle axle. If you're going to shoot a compound with fingers, you need a, from axle axle, you need a, you need a longer, uh, axle axle. And right now, just about very few companies are making the, the longer ones with fingers. Uh, everybody's shooting with a release these days. So the, the, uh, uh, axle to axle, uh, doesn't really come into that play and, unless you're hunting from a tree stand where you need a, a shorter bow or you're hunting from a, a, a ground blind where you might need a shorter bow. But the, you typically the, the longer axle to axle is a little more uh, forgiving, a little more smoother shooting bow. Okay. Um, so if, if some of you guys are missing that, what Johnny was saying about shooting with fingers, that's when you're actually drawing the, the bowstring back with your fingers. A lot of people nowadays, they get their bows set up with what they call a D loop, which is a little, you know, or C, it looks like a C or a D. It's attached to your bowstring right behind the arrow. And you can pull it with one of these, uh, in the middle of my shared screen, you'll see some different types of releases. Those are release aids that help you shoot basically by pulling a trigger or a thumb activating a, a release that gives you kind of the effect of a pulling the trigger on a rifle. Um, so it's a very smooth release in that sense. So releases are an additional piece of equipment that you might want to look at to help you shoot effectively. Uh, shooting with fingers on these short axles, like you, Johnny was saying, tends to pinch because when it comes back to full draw, the the bowstring is really narrow and could pinch your fingers. Uh, releases, I have three different releases here on the shared page. One's a drop away, there's a whisker biscuit, which is popular, and there's another target, um, what's that one called? It's a, let say a target site or a target. Uh, rest. Rest, sorry. And, um, once again, I know you guys were talking about what it's made of is very important. Uh, another thing, what what uh, I think we said was adjustments. Um, anything else that you want to add on that, Robert? The adjustability and materials. Um, well, the the three rests you talk about the the basic whisker biscuit. Uh, generally, uh, you'll find on a lot of the ready to hunt stuff originally. Mm -hmm. If you're just starting out, um, that's a very good rest to start with. Um, as you move up and progress in bow hunting, um, then possibly a drop away, maybe what you want to go. Um, the accuracy of the whisker biscuit for you, once it gets out there a little bit of ways, it does affect the flight of the arrow. Um, so any, anything uh, out past, say, 40 or 50 yards, it really starts to affect how the arrow goes. The drop away um, has less influence on the arrow and, uh, you know, is a little bit more accurate further out. In most cases, it's going to be a little bit more durable and have more adjustments to it than the whisker biscuit is. The target one that, that you were looking at, uh, I don't, I don't, have, I don't see the picture, but if it's related to fingers, like on a recurve, um, there's several models of that. But same thing, those some of them are, are really chintzy and, and break very easy, and some are really nice and are very durable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as far as any other equipment, we can we can tell you that you know this is the basics that'll get you started. So you'll get yourself a bow, you get yourself some arrows. They usually come in a half dozen or a dozen. I would recommend getting a dozen uh, because half a dozen uh, can maybe for a first time shooter might not last that long. Uh, you can lose some arrows right off the bat just trying to sight in your bow with your, uh, with your sight, your bow sight and uh, get a release. 
And uh, some of the bows will come with quivers attached to the bow. Uh, very important, you'll learn in a hunter education course at some point that you should have a covered quiver uh, somewhere to, to carry your arrows with because most of these arrows, when you're hunting game, they'll, you'll have broadheads on them and you wanna make sure that they're in a safe condition so that they don't get dull, they don't cut something unintentionally and um, you have them available on your person safely. So let's look at the next slide. So let's talk about a little bit about quality versus affordability. Um, if, if there was some type of area where you might make a, a slight, um, you know, I don't know what the word is, but say, uh, you know, I can go with a lesser value there. I, 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 I want to get this component also. Where would that be? Or, I mean, and what's that going to affect actually, Rob? <laughs> Um, probably the, the, the least, um, you know, the arrow rest or the sight, um, you could give up a little bit, but, uh, between the arrows and the bow, they have to be matched and you won't definitely want quality on both those. Yes. And John, you have anything to add? I mean, we're going to, we're, I, I know you said it yesterday. Basically you want to be able to be consistent. You want to be able to replicate your shot all the time and and some of your equipment will help you be better at that that option right yes uh if you if you had to go to the middle of the road or or below what 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 an item i i i would say don't use it for your bow or, or your arrows but your some accessories like your your sight uh like your release uh, uh you, you could definitely go start at the low end and work up okay but uh, uh now, I don't know how you guys are. Are you guys the type that uh, buy new bows every other year to keep up with the new equipment? Or do you have you had your bows for your favorite bows for a while? I, my, personally, I, I, I buy a bow. I just bought a bow. I just bought the new Hoyt. Oh. Uh, I, I just bought the new Hoyt uh, um, uh, Ventum 33. Uh, but, but the but bow I was shooting was four years old. Uh, and, and I usually like to keep a bow until I can't buy parts for it okay. or until they stop making parts for it. All right. Uh, consequently, uh, it, it's kind of like cars, you know, every year it's a new model and there's new something on it and you want to, you want to get that. Yeah. But, uh, uh the bows are, are, are very durable and you could, you could buy a bow and keep it, uh, and keep it as long as you want and it'd still be shooting. Uh, the problem comes when, uh, when the bow gets older and they break down. The, the company has moved on with different models and you can't buy parts for it. Okay. Yeah, because uh, I know how most people are that I've been around archery-wise. They're ready to get the newest, fastest bow because it's, you know, five feet faster than uh, per second than the model that they have. It's just like an iPhone, you know, they want the 5G instead of the 4G, even though the 4G works just fine. Yeah, so I, I bought the new Ventum because it's the first year that, uh, that Hoyt, has made a uh, a bow with the uh, um, a, diff a different cam system. Cam. Yeah. The, the, okay. They're they 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 usually they, they usually uh, do a, a cam and a half, and uh, and 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 they this year they made the the Ventum with a with a binary cam, and uh, it was it was it's new. Uh, I shot it and I liked it. It was so much different from the the bow that I was shooting that I I, I just couldn't say no. All right. So Johnny mentioned a word there that many of you might know, not know, and that's cam. Uh, if you can see on the shared screen, I'm kind of uh, outlining with the cursor. The cams are on the ends of the limbs. Uh, they hold the bow string and cable. And um, that is where all the companies make all their money because uh, the way they design those uh, physically with physics, using physics and mechanical physics is uh, makes it the the bow much easier to shoot, makes it that much faster, all those different things. So all their scientists that make these curves and, and timing of things, uh, that makes the ease, the easeability of the shot, the speed of the shot, all those things are very much so in the way the limbs and those cams work together. So um, that's where you'll recognize the difference when you shoot some of these bows. All right. 
Um, oops, cancel. Almost canceled the webinar here. Um, <clears throat> so where do we get where do we get help? Where do we find help besides the pro shops? Where are we going to find help on how to become an archer? Um, our department ourselves, we're trying to host these DFW webinars, uh, you know, on turkey hunting, on starting with a bow. I plan on having uh, archery hunting in the, for deer later on. That'll be a specific for deer. Uh, California, California Bowmen Hunters and State Archery Association. Can you tell, tell me a little bit about that, Robert, what, what that, that organization is? Um, so California Bowman Hunter State Archery Association or CBHSA um, has been organized based in 1943 uh, and been responsible for, for getting your archery seasons that you have now. The first one being in 1962 for, for a 10-day deer season. Um, on uh, their website, you'll find if you're looking for lessons, there's uh, a link there and it, it lists uh, shops and clubs up and down the state if you're looking for lessons. Um, also, if you're looking to get into tournaments or, or uh, any types of, of leagues or anything that involves shooting, say, 3D targets like 3D animals, getting ready for hunting, there'll be a list there. And this is statewide. So there should be something close to you in those links to uh, look for. Okay. Uh, I see a couple of questions that came up and, and um, I kind of want to address them before we get too far away from them. Uh, somebody was asking how long we, you could have a bow that you can shoot with, um, whether it breaks down. I know Johnny mentioned that uh, sometimes parts aren't available, but how do you keep a bow in good working condition? I mean, what, what are some of the things you need to avoid and some of the things that you need to take care of in order to keep that bow in good condition? If, if you're a, uh, you have a bow and you, you go hunting with it, so that's about all you do with it. Uh, so in the off season, it's just, just hanging around. Uh, say the bow, let's just say the bow is 50 pounds. After hunting, I would sit there and crank that bow down to a lesser weight. I wouldn't keep that 50 pounds on the bow year round. Mm -hmm. If you're going to shoot the bow year round, then that, that's, you know, or you go into tournament archery or whatever, or, or you hunt year round, then that's fine. But if the bow is going to be laying up, you know, on the wall somewhere or in the garage somewhere, I would, I would back off the weight. Uh, also, you want to keep uh, most of the limbs nowadays are, are, are solid fiberglass, and you want to keep them away from any heat source. You don't want them out in the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, uh, your strings, you want to make sure uh, you're, 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 you got the string and you got the, what they call cables, the two cables. You want to make sure they, they stay uh, waxed. Uh, and and you, there's a synthetic wax, so you can just use regular candle wax, uh, but uh, a lot goes a long way. You don't you don't want to just cake them up, but but you want you want to make sure they stay they stay uh, uh, waxed. Uh, it helps keep the moisture out, and uh, and it uh, gives you a life to the to the set of cables and string. Perfect. Thank you for that. That's a good good way. Um, <clears throat> the other place we can look for for these type of answers and questions and and honestly, uh, all you attendees, if you have any questions like this that don't get answered tonight please reach out to me. And if I don't know it, I'm going to pose it to Johnny or Robert to get the answer to you. So we are here to help you for, for, you know, this tradition. It's a great one. You'll, you'll enjoy it. It gets you out in the field. It's a quiet um, sport, uh, very meditating. And for you to get out there in the field and, and archery hunt, it's great. But to get help uh, besides us right here tonight, uh, try to go check out a local club the rangers uh ranges and while you're there try to find somebody that you can uh, form a relationship with uh, as a respected archer and a mentor possibly to help you out with this uh explain what you're uh what you're doing you're starting out uh, there's so many helpful people in the hunting and archery field that would definitely pick up um, the opportunity to, to mentor you and help you in along the way um, people like Johnny and Robert, they're always out at their ranges. Uh, what, what clubs, uh, well, you guys are in the Sacramento area. I think, what are you on the Maya uh, Archery? Uh, uh, yes, we belong to the, the Maya Bow Hunters or Maya Archers. Uh, 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 right there, uh, Robert and I both teach bow hunter education uh, there. Plus, Robert is a 
I like to call him our, our, our youth director. He, he teaches all the, all the youngsters and, and uh, uh, how to shoot the uh, 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 bow and arrow. Yeah. Uh, along with the, the adult students, yeah. And Robert shared a link with me that's gonna be in your links page that will uh, give you all the ranges uh, that you can check out. Maybe hopefully there's one near you, but um, let's talk about what a range usually set, has set up. Uh, Robert, can you explain what they'll find at a range? It's not going to be, you know, we're not talking about a rifle range. We're talking about an archery range. Uh, can you tell them what they might expect there? Um, basically, there's two types of ranges. If you have watched the Olympics, generally there's one shooting line and targets are, are uh, out further and you kind of stay in one location. The other range is called a field range and think of it as golf. Basically, you're going to walk a pattern or a loop and uh, shoot at targets and they can be short or long, maybe uphill, downhill, shoot across the canyon. Uh, it's more to simulating hunting conditions that you may encounter. Um, and there's several of them, you know, or many of them across the state. And uh, the link that you're gonna provide should list uh, all those out there, um, uh, the two different types, so. Yeah. Yeah, I visited a couple myself. I really liked, I went to one over there by uh, Pacifica uh, that was really nice. It was cool over there. I got out of the valley. I was able to go up in the trees. There was fog. Uh, it was really neat because it's like Robert said, it is like golf. You have different tees to shoot from. You know, if you're advanced, you can shoot from the farthest ones. Or if you're a beginner, you can shoot from some closer ones. And it, I think it was only like a $5 donation. It wasn't very expensive at all. A lot cheaper than the green fees on a uh, you know, private or public course. Um, so it's definitely, it was definitely a rewarding uh, thing I got to do. And I would recommend a lot of people to go out there and, and try that. Um, let me see, uh, what was another thing we were gonna talk about? Oops, sorry. Um, didn't mean to get out of there. Let me get back into my screen, it closed on me. I see a question there that said uh, a guy asked a person asked the question, "What's the best color of veins to, to use on the arrows?" Do you see that question? Uh, go ahead and answer that one, Johnny. I I like to use, of course, I like to use fluorescent orange. Uh, a lot of folks use like you know, like green and whatever, but if you miss the target and it's in the grass, uh, a green arrow will disappear in the grass where that uh, fluorescent orange or, or, or that just pops up. But I'd say uh, use any color that you wouldn't find, you know, uh, for ground, you know, from the ground, you know, like greens, browns, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, black, depending on uh, uh, what you're shooting, can disappear when, it, when the arrow hits the ground. All right, sorry about that. So we have some more questions and this is a good time for us to uh, get into some of these questions and make sure that we're, we're getting people's things answered. Um, how, are, how often are, should bow strings be replaced? Depends on how long you shoot them. I think you answered that. Make sure you keep them in a good condition. But if you see any frays or the, the material on your, your bow string seems to be, um, you know, having some little feathering uh you want to want to look at that right johnny uh, when is there a determined predetermined time okay. i mean how is somebody supposed to know exactly when the string needs to be replaced well as far as, as far as uh, uh replacement um all strings will stretch because the compound is under pressure at all times so all strings stretch uh, some stretch slower than others. You know, the higher quality strings stretch slower than others. And once the, the string starts to stretch past its string life, then it's time to get replaced. Those little fine hairs you're seeing on there, that's a sign of the, of the uh, oils of whatever uh, drying out of, the, out of the synthetic string. And uh, just a little synthetic uh, wax or, or regular wax can get, can get rid of that. But if you start seeing those, then it's telling, it's telling you that it's time to wax the string. Somebody here had a question on uh, what type of backstop to use for uh, practicing. Is there, 
and uh, any particular type that's better like you know the hay bales versus the the foam targets the cardboard ones whatever's available what what do you want to have for a, a backstop in my opinion if you, if you can afford it uh, the the foam the foam is better uh, uh, because here in California we're we're we so dry uh, and the bows nowadays are, are are so much more powerful and a lot more faster that because the hay bales dry out your your arrows zip through it um, but the, the foam targets uh, do do a lot as far as uh, stopping the arrows and and the, and the the longevity of a foam target versus a bale yeah. and uh, the the paper targets. Uh, it's easy to, our, our cardboard targets, it's easy to shoot through them and they fall apart. If they get wet, uh, then they start to, to, to deteriorate real quick. Yeah. Yesterday, um, Robert, when we talked about the progression of a bow hunter, so their first step, getting their equipment, making sure it's fitted right and it's safe for them to be having, uh, you know, that's not too short or too long on the draw length and they got all the proper equipment set up. And they try to get that tuned in. We, and there is a couple of links about tuning your bow. What tuning means is making sure, um, you know, well, you want to talk about tuning really quick, Robert, and then we'll go a little bit farther. Yeah, basically the, the process is, is, is moving the rest in and out and possibly up and down, depending on the quality of the rest mm -hmm. and the knock uh, on the string, moving it up and down. The, the goal is, is to get your arrow fly at the, flying the most efficient out of the bow. Um, that way it retains more kinetic, kinetic energy, and uh, especially if you're going to hunt. And um, uh, with, that, with that, like the kinetic energy, uh, it, you get an impact into the animal's going to be a little bit deeper. So um, that's it. So that's the tuning bow. We want to get the tuning right. Maybe take a lesson or maybe your pro shop where you buy your bow offers lessons for, you know, maybe, maybe three free lessons. Take advantage of those um, and then go out and shoot. Um, as far as your first uh, species that you may want to go after, maybe start with small game. So um, there's many game animals that can be taken with the bow, uh, rabbits, uh, squirrels. What did you guys first harvest? What were your first harvests? Uh, Robert, what was yours? Mine was a quail. A quail, okay. Mountain quail or a, a, a valley quail? Yeah, valley quail. Okay, how about you, Johnny? Uh, mine was uh, rabbits, uh, jackrabbits yeah. and cottontail. Okay, so when you, you, you went out hunting for these rabbits and squirrels, I mean, uh, quail, um, was there different materials or uh, equipment that you had you know, what, what are you going to pursue those with? I mean, we talked about bows and arrows. Are all arrows uh, going to be interchangeable for all the species, or is there different types of arrows that they should look at getting? All the whatever, go ahead. whatever bow, whatever arrows you pick that are fine for your bow will work for, for either for hunting, whether it's big game or small game. Okay. One thing you're going to change is, is the point. There's different points. So big game would be broadheads, small game, or small game points, wireheads, um, field points with adders, all those uh, are options for small game. Okay. And, and you could change the, uh, the fletching. Uh, my screen, I, I don't, I, I think I'm, I don't know if you see me on my screen, but I, I, I got a join the conversation thing on my screen. Is that, no, you. I can see. We can see you just right. well. There's your right. flu flu. Oh, that's that's the flu flu arrow. The, the, I I I said I hunted uh, uh, rabbits, uh, uh, and I also hunted pheasants. And with pheasants, you have to have a flu flu arrow. Uh, and this is a, 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 a considered a, a, a flu flu arrow. It's a, a, a full a full cut uh, feather. You don't you don't make it parabolic shape. And what, what that does is, and, and the more rough, the more rough it up is better because the more it catches the air. So when you shoot it, it goes like a, like a, like a streak for like 20 yards. And then it just stops and just floats down to the, to the ground. And what was so, what was so good about it when I had my, my Labrador, I would spray a uh, pheasant scent on the feathers. And once the arrow hit the ground, 
I could put my Labrador on, on, on that arrow and he'd go over there and, he, and he'd be smelling pheasant all the way to the arrow and bring it back to me. So it, it, it kept him hunting. Either, right. either hunting for the real thing or hunting for my arrows. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. All right, another question we have. Um, how much draw weight is needed to hunt a deer with a compound? Uh, I think that recently we had a law that said, well, it used to be cast a hunting arrow 130 yards, but I think it's there's now a minimum of 40 pounds. Is that correct? I think uh, it's, the minimum, I think minimum it's 30. 30. It's 30. How much? 30. 30. 30. 30. All right. Um, somebody said my screen is sharing a uh, Zoom Pro Tip screen from YouTube. I don't know. What yeah. That means. Yeah. It's, it's a, uh, just to join the conversation, follow your, there, oh. there we go, there we go. What's it on now, nothing? No, it's, it, it shows uh, me, you, and Robert. In, uh... right. We'll go there then. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that crowd. I'm sorry you saw whatever that was, but it wasn't anything bad, that's for sure. Um, <clears throat> we're talking about draw weights, uh, weight, it needs to be at least 35 pounds. Or 30, 30 pounds, pounds, 30 pounds, and cast a, a hunting arrow at least 130 yards. Yeah, that that regulation is new. I think it's only been in effect uh, either one or two years, so that's new. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm old school. It used to always be 130 yards, and we had to, uh, we we would usually know that your your bow could do that with the arrow that you had. Um, somebody had a question about strings, Flemish or Dacron strings. Which is better? That's a technical, but you guys want to offer an opinion on that? Okay, Flemish strings you see on your recurve, uh, and, and, and the Flemish string is not so much a, a type of material as it is the way the, the string itself is, is, is woven or is, is spun. It's, uh, 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 I think you can make uh, a Flemish string using the, the, the Dacron or, or, or the new, some of the new uh, string material. If you have an older bow, older recurve, uh, I'd be, uh, I would stick with Dacron because the, the, the bow tips were not made for the new, the new strings, the, the, the newer material strings. The, the new strings don't uh, stretch like the Dacron did. And you put a, put a, a, a fast flight string on, a, on an old recurve, you could snap off the, the, the tips of the bow. But, uh, but yeah, uh, uh, Dacron was, was old school. But every, everything now is probably going to fast flight or, or a whole bunch of different kind of synthetic string. Okay. Um, sorry, there's people putting stuff in the chats and in the questions, so it's kind of hard. I'm trying to make sure we address them correctly. So we're talking about progressions again. Uh, I just want to make sure people understand that where their goals should be, uh, because archery does have uh, a you know a progression. You can be out there hunting bull elk during the rut with uh, all kinds of things happening around you. But the basics are, is you need to learn how to shoot your bow. You need to be consistent with it. And uh, one way of being consistent is practice. Um, one of the cool things about archery practice is it's free. You're not wasting, uh, you're not having to pay for shells or cartridges in order to go out and practice. As long as you're hitting your target, uh, th those expensive arrows are reclaimed uh, not a big deal, but uh, it can be a very peaceful, fun thing to do. Um, myself, my first kill with my bow was a cottontail rabbit, and I was using judo tips. And um, it's a good, you know, it's a good practice to get out there, try to complete your stock, maybe have a uh, shooting from odd positions. Those are all the things that you need to consider when you're going to go out. You're never going to have an opportunity to shoot perfectly uh, standing every time uh, at a deer or an elk, you might have to be down on your knee. You might have to be crouched over. You might have uh, two knees down the ground. Um, there's all kinds of different um, positions you may be in when you need to take that shot. So you're gonna have to make sure you practice those uh, when you're out there in the field. Um, let's see what other kind of questions came in. What is the best type of barrel for a compound bone? Car, uh, bow, carbon, full metal jacket, etc. Manuel would like to know. Is there uh, a certain material? All right. The uh, each 
the aluminum uh, and carbon, uh, or you say he said the full metal jacket, that, that's a combination of both materials. That's aluminum on the outside and carbon on the inside. Uh, carbon is, is, is weight-wise, it's, it's lighter than aluminum. So uh, uh, if you have a, uh, just a carbon arrow, it can be lighter than aluminum. And if you're going to hunt big game, you might want to hunt with a, with a heavier arrow. So the, the, that's where the full metal jacket would come in. Or uh, you might just want to hunt with an aluminum arrow. Uh, aluminum arrows uh, versus carbon arrows. Uh, the, if you the aluminum arrows bend, if you miss hit something and it bends or you skip it off the ground and it bends, it's hard to get it straightened to get where you want to shoot some, uh, at a big game or whatever. You, you only get one shot in a lifetime and you don't want that arrow to be bent. Where your, your carbon arrows are more durable, uh, they are less affected with, with weather. And, and, uh, and uh, so that's uh, why we went to carbon. Okay. I saw something in there. Somebody was asking, and I don't know where it just, it just disappeared. Uh, kind of a term that I've never really heard. Um, it was called uh, string walking or? String, string walking. String walking is a, is, a, is a term used to the guys that shoot bare bow or, 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 or traditional archery, whatever. Instead of using a sight, they're shooting no sights and they position their hand somewhere up and down the string for each yardage that they shoot. Hmm. So, that when, so that when they pull it back, their arrow is point on at every yard, you know, it's point on at 20, it's point on at 30, it's point on at 40 or 50, whatever yards they wanted to shoot, they take their, their hand and they walk it up and down that string. So when they pull back to their anchor, they can look down the shaft and be point on at that distance. That's called, that's called a, a, a string walking. That's old. Now, the question was actually, Gap shooting, string walking, which works best for new archers? The gap shooting, in my opinion. It's easy to learn. Yeah, what gap it, shooting. Can you explain that uh, process? Okay. Uh, it's like I, uh, I, I me and Robert also teach a, a, a NAS program, National Archery in the Schools program, mm -hmm. and all those young people shoot with no sights and fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, they shoot at a distance of between 10 to 15 yards. We usually start them around 10 yards. And we tell them to take your, when you pull your bow back, put the point of the arrow that you can see, the last little part you can see, put that right on the bullseye, the spot. And we watch and see where that arrow hits. If that arrow hits above the target, right, then we know that uh, that's their, their, their gap from where the arrow's hitting to the center of that bullseye. Mm -hmm. You know, and then and we, then we'll tell them. And so and so the next, all right. Uh, instead of aiming at the at the bullseye now, just come down to that, like the the, the target is a multicolored target, like the, the Olympics. Yeah. Uh, and if they're if they're shooting pointing at the bullseye and they're hitting in the in the blue, the arrows are hitting in the uh, you know up above, but in the blue, yeah. we'll just tell them now take their your arrow and point it down at the bottom blue, and. It'll, it'll hit the bullseye. That's gap shooting. Finding finding the distance from the, the the target you want to hit and the point of your arrow. It's gap okay. shooting. So that takes a lot of practice there too. I mean, I know it, that it, 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 it takes a lot of practice, but it's a lot easier than uh, 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 spring walking. Spring walking. Gotcha. Some folks call it a, a, a point of aim shooting. Gotcha. So we've gone out and bought our bow. We've practiced. We're efficient. Um, what are some other materials or um, different tools of the trade that you need you should consider out there taking with you in on an archery hunt? Some of the tools of the trade, uh, uh, a good a good set of binoculars. Uh, a good a good range finder. Uh, if you don't know the distance, you'd be, you'd be hard pressed to be able to, to shoot but I have a I have a range finder that I use uh, and then I have a, a, a really good set of binoculars uh, anything that uh, can let enough light you know uh, we talked about earlier you talk about you take the 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 power of the binocular and divide it into the diameter of, of the object lens and if you come up with five that's as much light that comes through there to give you the best the best picture or, or the best uh, uh, a view using a binocular. So you're looking for something like 
seven by 35, 10 by 50s, eight by 42s, you know, yeah. get away from the 25 by 30s. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You want to make sure that that division, the power uh, into the objective gives you the closest um, to five. If it's greater than five, that means it's going to allow more light in. Uh, if it's way less than five, then you're going to be straining to see those objects with clarity. So very important to have fine optics. Um, if you don't have a range finder, you can't afford one. Um, just going out and looking at stuff and getting yourself practice and measuring it with other means, or even when I do have a range finder, I always like to check myself because sometimes you may not have time to range find and then shoot. So you might have to try and practice while you're in the field, look at a tree, judge the distance, confirm it with your range finder. It's a good practice. That way, when you have an instance where you may have an animal coming through, uh, you can get onto that ammo and shoot it uh, without having to range it. That's, that's something that might help, help you in the field. Um, what are some other things con uh, to consider? Uh, I like carrying an extra release in case I leave it somewhere. Yes, yes. Now, I had a couple of different ones in there. Um, the one I use wraps around my wrist, so I can't lose it. But there are some, I guess you can grab that uh, the thumb release kind. Uh, have you guys used those or are you guys all wear the re wrist uh, releases? Uh, I shoot both. Um, they're even the wrist strap though, if you take it off and have lunch and you just set it there, you could easily forget it at that point. So yeah, well, you, you can lose those. Yeah. I just rotate it around my wrist and, uh, you know, that way it's not in the way because most of the time those end up in the palm of your hand, they're ready to shoot. But when I'm not using it, I just kind of roll it around my wrist and it still stays with me. So I haven't lost my release yet. Yeah. I, I, I use both. Uh, Robert got me using the uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the the release made by Trueball, uh, thumb, thumb release, uh -huh. and uh, but I use both. Uh, when it comes to the with the scrap release, you know those straps with you know with the trigger, whatever you're talking about, mm -hmm. they may come where they got Velcro, and they may come where they got a, a buckle. Mm -hmm. I prefer the buckle. Uh, because I can count the number of holes in that and put that buckle in the same hole every time. Whereby if you use the, the Velcro, you might get it too tight one time and not the same same spot the next time. And that, and that uh, uh, the, the release be either flimsy or too tight on your uh, on your wrist and be in the wrong spot. I, so I prefer I, I prefer the buckle over the over the. Uh, That's good info. I like that. I, I have a Velcro one and maybe I need to change it. So thanks. It changes your draw length. So yes. you know, if you put it on too tight versus you know having it too loose, it, it can make either shorten or long or, or lengthen your draw length. Yeah. Now I'm not sure if you'll be able to help this person with this question, but for someone who is visually impaired, uh, even with the corrective lenses, do they have an adaptive sight or scope for a bow that could help somebody who has um, problems with the small pins and peeps? Is there? Yes. Yes, they're, they're like me, me being an old man. Uh, I have I, I have trifocals. I know you can't see them, but I use trifocals. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I put my when I put the, my bow out, whatever, my my pins are, are in my middle range, but I'm looking to, to the top part of my glasses at the target, so it makes my pins very blurry. Well, if you got a peep sight, and I and I get these confused, but there's a clear fire and a verifier that'll fit in that peep sight that, uh, that, that'll make your pin bright, along, you know, that sharp along with the target sharp. So you could, uh, you could uh, go to a pro shop and they could help you out with that. Perfect. I didn't know that, so thank you. Um, we didn't cover, color, cover broadheads uh, too much. There's so many different varieties of those. I would prefer people just to go on uh, line and make their own decisions or talk to a friend, somebody they respect. Um, there are so many different types. There's mechanical, there's fixed, there's a single blade where it's just a flat plane. There's three blades, four blades, wh wh whatever. But the rule is to make sure it has seven eighths of an inch and in cutting diameter that can't pass through a seven eighths inch um, diameter ring. 
Uh, yes. my, my views on, on broadheads, like you said, there's, there's several types, whether they're mechanical or fixed. Uh, the, the majority of them are, or just about all of them, just about are, are big, bigger than that seven eighths inch diameter. But that's usually, that's, uh, that's universal throughout the uh, United States as far as the hunting goes. Uh, but depending on the poundage you shoot, the less pound, like here in California, we now we got a, a 30 pound a minimum. I would say you want to shoot a two bladed broadhead versus a three, four or, or multiple blade broadhead. Uh, uh, because the, the less poundage, uh, the, it takes a lot more poundage to push a, a four bladed broadhead through an animal than a two bladed broadhead. So uh, if, you're, if you're not shooting the, the, uh, the, the heavy weight, uh, look for a, a two uh, or, or then maybe a three bladed broadhead. Now here, uh, somebody had a question about the hunting styles. Uh, said he was when he was on the East Coast uh, standing hunting and trees was the rage out here. It's always been spot and stock. Um, what's the recommendation one way or the other um, for somebody coming out here and trying archery? Is, are they going to be best off just trying to find a place to wait for game or go out and spot them and make a stock on them? Well, you're talking about a Kansas boy that came out to California and uh, we were, were tree stands, you know, and, and ground line. And then when I got out here, not knowing anything about the, the animals here and that there was no whitetail out here, it was all mule deer and blacktail. But I got a hold of the biologists from the department and they, they, they said that the, the deer I hunt, I hunted up around Chester. Uh, if you know where Chester, California is at, um, the deer migrate. They migrate from uh, the Chester area in the summer to um, uh, lower um, in the winter, and they go up and down the mountain. That being said, they're, I, I, I treated them like caribou. They, they use the same trails going up and coming back every year. Uh, and for me, it was easy, once I found a trail, it was easy for me to set up a tree stand mm -hmm. and, and catch them coming and going. Uh, I usually go up uh, uh, in May, the end of May, and I and I uh, uh, run the roads where I'm going to hunt, and I look at I you cut trails, and if all the trails that you cut of the track is coming up the mountain, and this is in May, I can guarantee you, in uh, 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 say August, September, October, when, when they start going back down, there that's the same trail they'll be using to go back down on because in May. If you up, if you're up in the high country, you won't see no trails going from bed to feeding in May. They're they're all coming up. Gotcha. Um, so, so yeah, Johnny shared with me that little little tip. Um, you know, go when there's still some snow, the tracks are visible. They're going to use those same routes for migration, uh, whether they're going up or down the mountain, and that's a good way to get yourself on a good game trail uh, for for the season. Um, Robert, have you had any experience with uh, ground blinds or anything like that uh, out here versus, you know, spot and stock? What's, what's been more effective for you? Um, actually, I use it as situational. So if I'm in an area where it's a lot of open country, then it's spot and stock. If I'm, say, on the coast in the redwoods or whatever, and it's close stuff, then I'm looking for a tree stand or ground blind. So I take in consider consideration where I'm hunting. Mm -hmm. to determine what I'm going to use or how I'm going to hunt. So uh, same with still hunting too. Yeah. And I can tell you, I was in a, in a blind uh, during turkey season and we, we had a lot of deer activity. So uh, there's a lot of times when sitting in one place and waiting uh, can be effective. So um, it's not always having to be out there on a prowl, but uh, being on the prowl is fun too. Uh, I can tell you that some of my most memorable bow hunts were when I was playing cat and mouse with a buck that was 20, far, 20 yards away from me. But every time he moved and I moved, we always had trees or something between us and I could never get the shot. But uh, it, it was so much fun. It was exhilarating. It took me over an hour of sneaking around on this thing that uh, eventually I, I just gave up because it got dark and we couldn't, we couldn't play the game anymore. But so much fun. Um, I think that's about it. We're a little bit over seven o'clock. I really appreciate 
some of the stuff that we've had. Um, somebody mentioned the importance of front of center with FOC uh, for steering arrows. Uh, we talked about this a little bit, um, Johnny, and that's referring to the weight above the center line, right? How much weight is out there? Yes. You want uh, there, there, if you look it up, uh, uh, we, we talk about uh, tuning, tuning your, your arrows, your bow. Uh, I have a, I don't know if you can see that right there, mm -hmm. but uh, Easton makes this pamphlet for, uh, for, for tuning. And it, it talks about uh, FOC, it talks about uh, knock points, talks about everything. And if you could, you could this is downloadable from Easton. So just look for uh, arrow tuning from Easton. All right. And it, it has all the, everything you talked about as far as the, uh, the FOC and all that. Perfect. All right. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and uh, end it with that. There are some questions on here that might want to, uh, <laughs> somebody asked, how do you keep calm? getting from from getting buck fever i don't know if there's an answer for that but practicing you need, with your bow you need to go to a tournament and 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 shoot with your compadres or i guess people you don't know yeah and you, you'll get just as excited about that as you would when the when the deer comes by but That's true. But, but by going to the tournaments you'll learn to control that anxi anxiety you get that practice to control that anxiety so that when you do get that one shot of a lifetime at an animal you can calm yourself down, pull yourself together, and make an active shot. All right. Any closing remarks, Robert? Um, just just get out there and get shooting. And uh, the most important thing is a lot of people think that equipment's going to fix their shooting problems. Yeah. Uh, as a coach, it is the person that's, that's probably causing the shooting problems. So if you're having problems grouping, don't blame the equipment first. You want to make sure that you're still shooting straight. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you guys, both both you gentlemen have been a real help to us tonight. If I get any questions, I might be sending them your way and I'm sure uh, we'll, we'll try to ha handle those problems for people. But for now, uh, enjoy what you have out there. If you don't have a bow yet, go get one. It's a great opportunity to go out there and just kind of melt away, uh, shoot some balloons, make some pops, shoot, the, shoot some targets. And uh, it's a good way to get some exercise and just have a nice quiet time. So thanks, uh, enjoy your pursuits and uh, thanks for sticking with me tonight. Uh, we started a little rocky, but we uh, finished strong. And uh, thank my panelists, my hunter ed instructors and the game wardens out there. Continue doing what you do, you do a good job and good night. All right. Good night. Good night, you guys.